These are the answers to the AP Chemistry Topics 1.4 to 1.6 Multiple Choice Question Practice Packet. If you look in the video description area, there is a link to the packet that accompanies this video. Let's take a look at our first multiple choice question, number one. A student performed a gravimetric analysis experiment to determine the percentage of silver by mass in an alloy containing a mixture of silver and copper. A sample of the alloy is dissolved completely in a solution of nitric acid forming the aqueous ions Ag plus and Cu2 plus. So although we are given the mass of the silver copper alloy, which is 2.00 grams, we can't really do anything with that number. Let's keep reading the question and figure out what the experiment is all about. So the alloy is dissolved in nitric acid, forming the aqueous ions Ag plus and Cu2 plus, and then an excess amount of aqueous sodium chloride is added to this solution, causing the formation of a precipitate AgCl, so solid silver chloride. Then the student collects the precipitate by filtration and dries it and records its mass. So again, the mass of the AgCl precipitate is 0.72 grams. So going back to the original alloy, all of the silver that was present in the alloy has been converted into a solid precipitate. So how many grams of silver are present in 0.72 grams of silver chloride? We can use the periodic table to do this calculation. Let's take a look at the formula mass or the molar mass of AgCl. It's 143.32. We have AgCl from this experiment, 0.72 grams of AgCl, silver chloride. Let's use the periodic table. We'll put grams of silver chloride on the bottom and then grams of silver on the top. And that's 107.87 grams of silver for every 143.32 grams of silver chloride. Now, when we do this math, we get approximately 0.54. And when students are not paying attention to their units, they might think that that is 54%. And so choice C seems like a very attractive answer, but this is not a percentage of silver by mass. This is the mass of silver in the two gram sample of the alloy. So to find the percent of silver by mass, we have to take 0.54 grams and divide that by the mass of the alloy, the mixture, and then times 100. So 0.54 divided by 2 times 100, that gives us the correct answer, which is 27% silver by mass. So A is the correct answer to this question. Question 2 says the mass percent of potassium in pure potassium sulfate, K2SO4, is 45%. Just to show you where that number comes from, if we look at the periodic table and we calculate the molar mass or the formula mass of potassium sulfate, K2SO4, we get 174.26. If we calculate the percentage of potassium by mass in K2SO4, 78.20 grams of potassium for every 174.26 grams of potassium sulfate we get about 45% potassium. So a chemist analyzes an impure sample of potassium sulfate and determines that the mass percent of potassium is 50%. So the sample of potassium sulfate contains an impurity. The impurity causes the percent of potassium to be too high because 50% is greater than 45%. So which of the following impurities could account for the high mass percent of potassium in the sample, we need to choose the compound that has a value for percent potassium by mass that would be greater than 45%, causing the percent of potassium in the mixture to be too high. So I'll start with potassium bromide. And if I look on the periodic table, I can determine the molar mass or the formula mass of potassium bromide. 39.10 divided by 119 times 100, and I get 33%. That's not higher than 45%, so therefore I can eliminate choice A. Moving on to potassium iodide, 
that molar mass is even heavier, so the percentage of potassium is going to be even smaller. 39.1 divided by 166, that's only 24% potassium by mass. So I still haven't found my answer yet. I'm looking for one in which the percent potassium by mass is greater than 45%. So I've eliminated choices A and B. Here's potassium cyanide, so potassium, carbon, and nitrogen. And when I run the numbers, 39.1 divided by 65.12, I get 60% potassium by mass. So that should be my answer since 60% is greater than 45. That would cause the percent potassium in the mixture to be too high. Uh, just to confirm that D is not the correct answer, when I run the numbers for potassium permanganate, so KMNO4, I do the math of potassium divided by the formula mass or the molar mass, and I get 25% potassium. So again, that's too small. So looking for a number that would cause the mass percent of potassium to be too high, correct answer is C, potassium cyanide. Okay, this is question three. A mixture of lithium chloride and sodium chloride is analyzed and found to contain 5.00% lithium by mass. Which of the following best represents the mass percent of lithium chloride in this mixture? Now we are given the percentage of lithium by mass, so let's assume that the total mass of the mixture is equal to 100 grams. So 5% of 100 is 5. Now we know the mass of lithium present in the mixture is equal to 5.00 grams. With the periodic table, we can calculate the formula mass or the molar mass of lithium chloride. And if we start with five grams of lithium, let's convert grams of lithium into grams of lithium chloride because it's the mass percent of lithium chloride in the mixture. That's what we're trying to find. So from grams of lithium to grams of lithium chloride, it would look something like this. Grams of lithium on the bottom, grams of lithium chloride on the top. And so if we do the math, based on the information from the periodic table, we get 30.5 grams of lithium chloride that comes from five grams of lithium. Now, since we assume that the total mass of the mixture is 100 grams, then 30.5 divided by 100, that gives us 30.5% lithium chloride by mass. So now we know the correct answer to number three is B. All right, this is question four, and we have switched topics. So instead of talking about the percent composition of a mixture, now we're talking about electron configuration. So which of the following represents the ground state electron configuration for an atom of tin, element symbol Sn? The electron configuration is the distribution of the electrons in an atom or an ion, and there are patterns on the periodic table that will help us to write the electron configuration. So tin is atomic number 50, has the element symbol Sn. Let's start with 1s2, so the first period, and then 2s2, followed by 2p6. So now we're done with period two. And then moving on to the next period, we have 3s2, 3p6. So we're gonna keep going until we get to element number 50. Fourth period, we have 4s2, 3d10, 4p6. Moving on to period five, we have 5s2, 4d10. And then now we get to 10, it's going to be 5p2. So that's where 10 is located on the periodic table. And I've highlighted krypton as well because we can abbreviate the first 36 electrons of this configuration with putting krypton in brackets. So krypton, 5s2, 4d10, 5p2. That's the electron configuration for tin. And sometimes you'll notice that the 4d and the 5s can be flipped around in terms of how we write it. So sometimes they put the highest quantum numbers, the highest energy levels at the very end. So looking now at this particular configuration for tin, krypton, 4d10, 5s2, 5p2, that tells us that the correct answer to number four is B. Question 
Five, which of the following choices correctly identifies the number of unpaired electrons in the ground state electron configuration for an atom of that element? So we'll start with choice A, which is sulfur. Sulfur has atomic number 16, and that would be an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and then finally where sulfur is located, that would be 3p4. So knowing this electron configuration is good, but we still have to fill in the orbital diagram using arrows to represent the electrons. So let's put 16 electrons into the electron diagram, the orbital diagram. And when we do that for sulfur, this is what it looks like. So all of the boxes have two arrows except for those last two boxes. There are two unpaired electrons in the electron configuration for sulfur. So that means that choice A is not the correct answer because it says one unpaired electron and there are actually two. Let's move on to magnesium. So magnesium 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. When we fill in those 12 electrons for magnesium into the orbital diagram, there are zero unpaired electrons. So we've now eliminated choice B because it says two unpaired electrons. Okay, so it's not choice A and it's not choice B. Moving on to cobalt, atomic number 27, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, and then finally where cobalt is, it would be 3d7. So that is the electron configuration for cobalt. Let's take a look at that 3d sublevel and see how all those arrows go into the boxes. So take a look at the 3d sublevel, 3d7, and in fact, you can see that we have exactly three unpaired electrons in that ground state electron configuration. So pretty confident that C, cobalt, is the correct answer. Let's move on to choice D and just verify that titanium has a different number of unpaired electrons than what it says in the choice. So titanium, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, and then finally with titanium would be 3d2. When we fill in the arrows into the orbital diagram for titanium, there are only two unpaired electrons. So again, choice D is now eliminated. Correct answer to this question, number five, is C. Three unpaired electrons for the ground state electron configuration of cobalt. Question six. Which of the following represents the ground state electron configuration for the manganese 3 plus ion? Well, let's start with the ground state electron configuration of the manganese atom and then go from there. So manganese on the periodic table has atomic number 25 and the electron configuration of the atom would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, and then finally where manganese is, that would be 3d5. So that's where all 25 electrons are located for the atom. But when an atom of a transition metal, such as that middle region of the periodic table between scandium and zinc, those columns, loses electrons to become a cation, the electrons are first removed from the valence s orbitals. So the first two electrons to be removed from a manganese atom are going to come from the 4s sublevel. That would give us a manganese 2 plus ion that looks like this 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and then 3d5. There are no more 4s electrons. But since we're trying to get to manganese 3 plus, one more electron is now removed from the valence d orbital, so from the 3d sublevel. And so for manganese 3 plus, that would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and then it stops at 3d4. So looking at our four choices, the correct answer, which has 3d4, and all of the 4s electrons have already been removed, correct answer to number six is choice D. All right, this is question seven, and now we're switching to a different topic. This is about photoelectron spectroscopy. 
The question says that the binding energy is 2.37 megajoules per mole for the 1s electrons in a helium atom. Which of the following correctly identifies the binding energy values for the 1s electrons of lithium and beryllium and provides the correct justification? So we're talking about the 1s electrons and the binding energy for two different atoms. Before we take a look at the four choices, this is a question that you have seen before in a packet that was on topic 1.6, so photoelectron spectroscopy. And in this particular question, it was comparing nitrogen and oxygen. So nitrogen has seven protons in its nucleus, whereas oxygen has eight protons in its nucleus. And the element with more protons has a greater nuclear charge and should experience a stronger attraction for the 1s electrons, resulting in a greater binding energy. So here we have lithium and beryllium. Lithium has three protons, beryllium has four protons. Again, the element with more protons, beryllium, should experience a greater attraction for those 1s electrons and a higher binding energy. Now looking at our four choices, the correct answer is either A or B, where beryllium, having more protons, has a higher binding energy for the 1s electrons. Now for the justification. It's not about electron-electron repulsions. It's about the fact that beryllium has more protons, and so lithium having a smaller nuclear charge than beryllium, it's comparing three protons versus four protons and connecting that to the magnitude of the binding energy. So again, the correct answer for number seven is A. Question eight. The photoelectron spectra of the 1s electrons of two isoelectronic species, calcium 2 plus and argon, are shown above. So we are focusing on the 1s electrons. We have only two peaks in this diagram, and we're going to decide which one of those peaks would represent the binding energy of the 1s electrons in the calcium ion, calcium 2 plus and which one of those peaks represents the binding energy of the 1s electrons in argon. So these are isoelectronic. That's a fancy word for just it has the same number of electrons. So both calcium 2 plus and argon have the same number of electrons, which is 18. But what's different about them? How are they different? Let's think about the nucleus. Remember that the attraction between the 1s electrons and the nucleus is going to affect the binding energy. Well, calcium has 20 protons and argon has 18 protons. So that's gonna be the difference that we should focus on. Whoever has more protons has a stronger attraction to the nucleus. And so these 1s electrons are more strongly attracted to the calcium nucleus than to the argon nucleus. Since peak X has a higher binding energy, then peak X represents the 1s electrons of calcium not because the nuclear mass is greater, but because there's more protons, a greater magnitude of charge. So correct answer to number eight is D, focusing on the magnitude of the charge and the number of protons in the nucleus. Question nine, the complete photoelectron spectrum of a pure element is shown in the diagram above. According to the complete photoelectron spectrum, which of the following is the identity of the element? So because the highest binding energy is on the left and the lowest binding energy is on the right, all we have to do is read the electron configuration of this element by going from left to right. So starting with the far left, that would be 1s, so 1s2. All of these three peaks are at the same height on the y-axis, so each of these sublevels contains two electrons. So after 1s2 is 2s2, and then finally, 2p, so 2p2, 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. That corresponds to a total of six electrons. This is the ground state electron configuration for the element carbon. So the correct answer for number nine is C, referring to carbon. All right, well, that particular question is the last one in the packet. So this comes to the end of the video. I hope that these answers and explanations were helpful. Thanks for watching.